Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tevedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different properties of the enzyme in the course Enzyme Science and Technology. In this context, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the development of the uh, field of enzymology, we discuss about the different properties of the enzyme and then uh, in the previous module uh, we have also discussed about the uh, different structures of the enzyme. So, we have discussed about the primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure and quaternary structure. Not only the structure, we have also discussed about the different methods through which you can be able to determine these structures and now in the current module, we are discussing about how you can be able to produce the enzyme in the large quantities. And if you recall, in the previous uh, few lectures, uh, we have discussed about how you can be able to isolate the gene of the interest. Uh, so, we have discussed about the two approaches. We have discussed about the approach when the genomic sequences are not known. And uh, in that context, we have discussed, we have uh, discussed about the uh, genomic library approach and then we have also discussed about the CDNA library approach. Uh, not only that, uh, when the genomic sequences are known, then you can be able to use the technique which is called as polymerase chain reactions. So, with the help of the site specific primers, you can be able to amplify the gene of your interest and that's how you are going, ultimately you are going to get the gene fragments. So, either you use the genomic uh, library or cDNA library or the PCR, ultimately you are going to get the gene fragments and then this, this, this particular gene fragment has to be cloned into a uh, suitable vector so that you can be able to use that for downstream applications. So, uh, this is what we have discussed. We have discussed about the different approaches for isolation of the gene. So, we discuss about the approach when the uh, gene sequence is not known. That is the condition when the pre-genomic era, when the genome sequences are not known. Even today also uh, for some of the organisms, the uh, gene sequences are not known, right? So, then you can actually be able to go with the, either the genomic library approach or the cDNA library approach. And then the post genomic era, we are actually sequencing the genomes of the different organisms, the gene sequence is known. So, in those cases, you can actually be able to utilize the genomic sequences, you can prepare the site specific primers and that is how you are going to get the, uh, the gene fragment which you are looking for and that you can actually be able to clone. So, whether you use this approach or whether you use this approach, you are actually going to get the gene fragment and uh, this gene fragment has to be cloned into a suitable vector. But cloning a gene fragment into a vector is a multi-step process where you are going to take this gene fragment and you are actually going to digest the gene fragment with the help of the restriction enzymes. Okay. And uh, once you are going to get the uh, cut fragment, then you are also going to cut the vector with the same set of restriction enzymes. Okay. So, uh, this is all uh, we have discussed uh, in this uh, cartoon. So, what you have is from the genome, you have isolated the gene fragment. So, this is the gene fragment you have isolated. Uh, this could be either by the uh, genomic library approach or it could be by the cDNA library approach. So, either you use the genomic library or you can use the cDNA library or you can actually be able to do the PCR. Uh, ultimately, what you are going to get is you are going to get the gene fragment. Now, this, this gene fragment has to be digested with the restriction enzymes so that you are going to get the sticky ends. So, these are the sticky ends what you are going to generate uh, when you are going to digest the fragments with the session enzymes. So, uh, on both the sides. So, you can actually be able to have the flexibility of using the same enzyme or you can use the uh, two restriction enzymes. So, in that case, uh, you are going to have the two fragments. Similarly, you can use the vector. So, vector could be a plasmid and that plasmid also has to be done uh, has to be performed restriction digestion with the same set of uh, RE1 and RE2 and that is how you are going to have the RE1 and RE2 on both the ends. So, you are going to have the sticky ends 
on the plasmids you are going to have the sticky end on the fragments and then you are going to put that for ligation reactions uh, which is going to be catalyzed by an enzyme which is called as ligase and then ultimately you are going to get the ligated chimeric plasmid this ligated chimeric plasmid has to be transformed into a suitable host so in this case we have taken the example of the bacteria so you can actually be able to do the transformation into the bacteria and that's how you're going to get the transformed bacteria and this transformed bacteria has to be screened for the positive clones and these are the positive clone which actually contains the uh, the plasmid or the chimeric plasmid of interest so what you see here is that in this particular process we are actually utilizing the different types of enzymes and we are also utilizing the different types of vectors so what we are using we are actually utilizing the enzyme and we are also utilizing the different types of vectors because the vectors could be different types so what are the enzymes we are utilizing we are actually utilizing the restriction enzymes uh, we are utilizing the ligase and we are also going to utilize the other enzymes which are going to be participate or which are required actually for the uh, cloning reactions right so cloning of a gene uh, requires the information about the enzymes what you are going to use for the cloning and the vectors the different types of vectors uh, you can have the vectors as per the host so you can have the vector for the uh, bacterial system you can have the vectors for the yeast system you can have the bacteria for the uh, vector for the insect cell lines and you can also have the vectors which are for the uh, mammalian system and you can also have the vectors which is for the uh, bacteriophage so uh, these are the uh, two important thing which we could discuss how you are going to perform these reactions so before we get into the details of the cloning of the gene into a suitable vector we have to have the complete information about these enzymes uh, and as well as the different types of vectors which are available so uh, the enzymes which are available in the or which are actually going to be used in the molecular cloning are restriction enzymes the purpose of this restriction enzyme is to cut the dna at the specific site uh, for example in our in our previous uh, slide we have used the restriction enzyme like restriction enzyme 1 and restriction enzyme 2 so both of these restriction enzymes are specific so they are actually going to be specific for their own sequence then you can also use the polymerase so polymerase is actually going to use for pcr amplifications if you recall when we were discussing about the pcr we we talk about the talk dna polymerase and we have also discussed about the uh, pfu polymerase so that we are going to use for uh, you know amplifying the gene fragments then we can also use the alkaline phosphatase the purpose of the alkaline phosphatase is that it is going to remove the terminal phosphate group and that actually is going to make the reactions or the ligation uh, more specific and then uh, we are also going to use the dna ligase so dna ligase is going to join the two dna fragments so in this case fragment one is going to be the gene amplified gene product the fragment 2 is going to be uh, the cut plasmid right so uh, both of these you can actually be able to use for the uh, molecular cloning so let's start first with the restriction enzymes so restriction enzymes are actually be a part of the restriction methylase system and restriction methylase system is a defense system what is being present in the bacterial system so it actually allows the bacteria to make a distinction between the self versus the foreign dna although the precise mechanism of distinction is not known but based on the available literature in the absence of the methylation a closed complex is formed and it allows the proper activation of the cleavage activity of the enzyme but presence of methyl group even the hemimethylation on the nucleotide does not allow the formation of the close complex and consequently enzymes fall from the enzyme so what is mean is that you can have the two different types of uh, enzymes okay 
and so for example you can have the two different types of the dna one is unmethylated dna and in unmethylated dna uh, you what you will happen is that because the methylation is not present when the dna will go and bind it is actually going to make when the restriction enzyme will go and bind it is actually going to make the closed complex and that's why it is actually going to cleave the dna whereas when it is a methylated which means if adenine is actually going to be methylated it is actually going to not allow the enzyme to form a closed complex and in that case it is going to be get protected from the cleavage this means this is going to be considered as the self dna and this is going to be considered as non self dna and this kind of distinction is very important because the bacteria does not allow or does not want the non self which means the organism the, the different organisms dna to be propagated now how this uh, actually going to happen is that in the restriction and methylation system you have the different types of restriction sites you can have the re1 re2 re3 re4 so what will happen is that the restriction uh, you know enzymes are actually non specifically will go and bind to these sites but in some of one of the sites it is actually going to form a very tight complex and when it will form the tight complex all these uh, subunits such as the rsm we are actually going to participate into the reactions so how the restriction methylation system is going to work is first they are actually going to recognize the cleavage sites so type 2 restriction enzymes have the specific recognition sequences to rapidly identify the site enzyme scans the stretch of dna through a non specific interaction and the diffusion along the length of dna which means if you have the four restriction sites the type 2 restriction enzyme will actually going to bind uh, all of these very rapidly okay so that they will know which restriction site is having the very very you know high affinity to expedite the recognition process the enzyme does not make interaction with the bases instead of it makes a contact with the dna backbone so once the recognition is over then it is actually going to bind the recognition site for example in this case this is the red one is actually is going to be considered as recognition recognition site so once the recognition site is located enzymes makes specific interaction with the nucleotide present at the recognition site via entry through the major group hydrogen bonding wonder wall interactions play a crucial role in this step the enzyme dna close complex formation induces the major conformational changes in the restriction enzymes and then once the it will go and bind then it is actually going to catalyze the cleavage reaction the closed complex activate the cleavage activity of the enzyme resulting into the introduction of the dna breaks on both the strands to give the fragment with 3 prime hydroxyl and as well as the 5 prime hydroxyl group so on one side it is actually going to have the 3 prime hydroxyl and the other side it is actually going to have the 5 prime phosphate since we have isolated uh, so many restriction enzymes uh, type 2 type 1 type 2 so we should also have a system so that you can be able to put the uh, the nomenclature of these restriction enzymes so due to the extensive search of the presence of restriction enzyme in different microorganisms a nomenclature system has been adopted in this system first alphabet represent the name of the genus second alphabet represent the species third alphabet gives the information about the strain and the fourth is the order in which that enzyme has been isolated from a particular microorganism for example we have a restriction enzyme name as eco r1 so in the eco r1 the first alphabet e is actually uh, corresponds to the genus eschersia okay so this is the genus from which the enzyme is been isolated then the second uh, term is called co so that is the uh, species so co is the coli so coli is the species of the e coli then we also have the third uh, alphabets and third alphabet is r so r is the strain so ry13 strain is the strain of source of this and since and then we have the one so it is the first restriction enzyme from this bacteria uh, that is why its name is eco r1 similarly you can have the hin3 you can have uh, uh, mamh1 and so on 
uh, we can have the different types of restriction enzymes. Uh, so we can have the type 1 restriction enzyme, we can have type 3 restriction enzyme and we also can have the type 2 restriction enzymes. So the type 1, the recognition site of the type 1 restriction enzyme consists of 3 to 4 nucleotide at the 3 prime and followed by a non-specific stretch of 6 to 8 nucleotide and a 4 nucleotide at the 5 prime. The cleavage site is approximately 1000 base pair away from the restriction site and it is presumed to cleavage follow a DNA translocation enzyme. Two cofactor uh, s adenosyl methionine SAM, ATP and the magnesium ions are required for the full activity. Type restriction enzyme has dual enzymatic activity which means it is going to have the restriction and as well as the methylation. It is due to the subunit composition of the enzyme. So it has three subunits HDSR, HDSM and HDSS to perform the restriction, methylation and HDSS provide the specificity to the recognition of the DNA. But as you can see that the type 1 restriction enzyme is actually not going to have uh, a cleavage site within the recognition site. So it's going to have a cleavage site which is 1000 base pair away from the restriction site. So it's, you can imagine that if the enzyme is recognizing this particular site as a restriction site, it is actually going to cleave somewhere here. This means the cleavage and as well as recognition is going to be different. So that's why these type 1 restriction enzymes are not useful for the molecular cloning. Similarly, the type 3 restriction enzyme, the type 3 restriction enzyme has two separate palindromic sequences. So the recognition site has two separate palindromic sequences arranged inversely oriented. The cutting site is 20 to 30 base pair away from the recognition site, which means these are also not going to be useful for the molecular cloning because uh, they are not useful for the molecular cloning because their recognition site and their cutting site is different. Then we have type 2 restriction enzymes. So the recognition site of type 2 enzyme is 4 to 8 nucleotide long and it cuts the DNA within the restriction site which means they are actually going to be useful for the uh, molecular cloning because they are cutting within the restriction site. So with, with, with their recognition site and their cutting site are uh, within that. So due to this feature, the type 2 restriction enzymes have a specific application in the genetic injury for the cloning purposes. It is composed of three subunit, M, R and S. The type 2 restriction enzymes are of diversified nature and are further classified due to the unique feature of each class, which means the type 2E, type 2B and type 2M. Type 2E, these class of enzymes have cleave DNA containing two restriction sites. One site induced activates the enzyme to cut the DNA on the other side. Similarly, you can have type 2B. These enzyme cuts on both sides of the restriction site to remove the site from the DNA. And then you have type 2M. This restriction cut methylated DNA, for example, DPM. So this is a specific class of enzyme which actually are restriction enzymes, but they only cut the methylated DNA rather than the unmethylated DNA. So then I have given you a table where I have compared the properties of the restriction enzymes. So you can have the characteristics of the type 1, type 2 and type 3 and uh, type 2 restriction enzymes are useful for molecular cloning only with the reason that they are actually the restriction site is palindromic in nature. They are actually going to recognize the site and they are actually going to cut the site within the restriction site. So it means uh, wherever they are actually going to recognize, they are actually going to cut the DNA as well. Now, what is mean by the uh, palindromic sequences? So, palindromic sequences are the sequences which actually can uh, read the same uh, either if you read from the forward direction to reverse direction or from the reverse direction to forward direction. For example, you have a sequence called GGATCC. So, if you read from this side, it will say GGA. Similarly, if you read this from the reverse orientation, it will say GGA. This means these two are palindromic to each other. Similarly, you can read from this side to this side, it will say TCC. If you read from this side to this side, it will say TCC. So this means if you read in the forward direction or if you read in the reverse direction, it is actually going to give you the same sequence. 
So the recognition sequences of type 2 recession enzyme is palindromic. It means that the sequence readout will be same in forward and the reverse direction. For example, the BAMH1 has a recognition site as GGATTC as shown below and the black arrow on strand 1 and strand 2 will read the same sequence. Same is applicable to the blue arrow as well. Okay. Then uh, it also generates the sticky ends. So what is mean by the sticky end? The type 2 section enzyme cut the both DNA strand together to generate the DNA with the hanging DNA stretch with 4 to 6 nucleotide. These DNA stretch containing the fragments are cohesive to each other as sequence present on complex 1 will be complementary to the sequence present on the complex 2. For example, this is the uh, site for the damage one. So what it's going to cut is it is going to cut here just after the G, right? So it's a GGATCC. So when you cut it with the damage one, it is going to generate these sequences. So it's going to generate a G and then it's going to generate this overhang. So this overhang region is actually going to have the affinity for this overhang, which is actually going to be present in the other sequence. So that's why if you see to these two are actually going to have the sticky end. So you can imagine that if this is actually from the vector and this is from the insert and if you put them together, they will actually come together and they will actually going to uh, make the uh, uh, bonds together. So that's why these sticky ends are very useful in terms of the molecular cloning. Now the question comes how you are going to set up the restriction reactions. So for restriction reactions, you require the following components. You can require the DNA. So DNA means either the vector or the DNA fragment, what you have uh, you know, amplified from the PCR. So you require the DNA. So number one, you require the DNA. Then you require the restriction enzymes. You require the buffer. You require the VSA. You require the sterile water and the total volume. So in a total volume of 50 microliter, you are going to perform the restriction enzymes reactions. So what you're going to do is you're going to take the DNA. So for example, I have taken a DNA of one microgram. Then I'm going to put the reactions uh, in the range of 0.5 to 10 units per reactions. So normally the restriction enzymes, so what you are going to get from the uh, vendors are in the range of 20,000 units per ml and they are in the 50% glycerol because mostly the restriction enzymes are being uh, stored at minus 20 degrees Celsius. So they will be always be kept in the 50% glycerol so that they should not get uh, freeze. Okay, Because if you do a repeated freezing thawing of your enzyme, it is actually going to deactivate or it is going to reduce its activity. Then you also require the buffer in which the activity of these enzymes are actually going to be very high. These buffers are mostly contains the ATP and all other kinds of uh, you know molecules so that and they also have the specific uh, you know buffer and pH so that they can be able to give you the 100% activity. Then you also require the BSA in some cases uh, where the enzymes are not compatible to each other so you are actually going to put the BSA and then you also ultimately going to make up the volume with the water okay so the order in which you are going to put the reactions are you are going to first take the water then you are actually going to take the buffer then you are going to take the enzymes and then you are actually going to add the bsa if there is a need to add the bsa and then ultimately you are going to add the dna and that's how you are actually going to set up the reactions why we do actually add the BSA because we want to reduce the star activity. So what is mean by the star activity? Star activity is that is ideally the restriction enzyme should recognize the particular DNA stretch and then they are actually going to make a cleavage within that site. But what happened is that because you have too much uh, enzymes or you have too many DNA, restriction enzymes are actually going to show uh, aberrant uh, cutting site okay so aberrant cutting and uh, that happens sometime even with the glycerol itself so if you have the 10 percent or more glycerol so if you have the 10 percent or more uh, it's actually going to induce the star activity number two if you are taking a you know combinations of some enzymes like for example if you take the eco r1 so eco r1 is known to provide or show the star activity so if you take the eco r1 versus um, other enzymes like xba1 
so in that case uh, the eco r1 there is a chance that eco r1 will show you the star activity so what is mean by the star activity is that it is going to give you the aberrant cutting so wherever the enzyme is supposed to cut it will not cut to that side it will cut to somewhere else so in that case you will not going to get the specific um, you know sticky ends and if you don't get the sticky uh, specific sticky ends it will actually going to create trouble in terms of the um, you know the uh, the ligations so uh, once you set up the uh, recession enzymes reactions you are actually going to uh, incubate the reactions at 12 to 18 hours uh, for at 37 degrees celsius uh, mostly in a water bath rather than the dry bath because uh, water bath is actually soft in terms of providing the uh, temperature or incubating the temperature uh, sometime when you are uh, you know not sure about the activity of these enzymes to the ends, uh, to the DNA, then you can actually be able to do a, a time curve. For example, you can do the reaction for one hour, four hours like that to so to need to know that whether the enzymes are cutting the DNA or not. Then we'll talk about the second enzyme. So second enzyme is the ligase. So ligase, the joining the two DNA to generate the chimeric DNA is the basis of cloning. It is essential step to generate the clones containing foreign DNA in a vector. When cohesive ends generated by the action of station endonuclease on the DNA associate with each other, a nick remain to seal and give complete circular DNA. Okay. So what the DNA ligase is doing? It is an enzyme which requires ATP or NAD plus as a cofactor to catalyze ligation reaction. Ligase is processing ATP to generate AMP and then AMP is making an adduct with the enzyme to form the ligase AMP complex. This complex is binding to the 3 prime and the 5 prime of the DNA bearing NICs and bringing them together. AMP is released and the phosphodiester linkage is formed between the 3 prime and 5 prime end of the seal okay and that's how it is actually going to seal the nick so this is what is going to happen okay when you are going to add the uh, ligase along with atp so what will happen is that we have taken an example of two different enzymes we have taken the enzyme of t4 dna ligase or the e coli dna ligase in the case of t4 dna ligase it is actually going to utilize the atp as a source of the uh, the phosphate so it is actually going to bring the uh, NICs uh, closer to each other and that's how the AMP is going to bind and ultimately uh, the AMP is actually going to bring the 3 prime and 5 prime together and ultimately there will be a bond which is going to be formed between the 3 prime uh, hydroxyl and the 5 prime uh, phosphate and uh, that's how and, and the AMP is actually going to be released. Uh, in the case of uh, in the case of the uh, e. coli DNA ligase you are going to use the NAD plus as a cofactor and that's how uh, the reactions remain the same except that the NAD plus is actually going to provide the same same kind of uh, support to bring the uh, 3 prime hydroxyl to the 5 prime uh, phosphate and that's how it is actually going to make a bond and it will actually going to seal the nick. Now how you are going to set up the ligase reactions? So, uh, you're going to take the two DNA, right, DNA vector or the insert, right. So you're going to take the two, two DNA source. Then uh, you are always going to maintain the vector versus insert ratio in S2, 1, S2, 3. This means, uh, and this is in terms of the uh, moles, okay. It's not in terms of micrograms, okay. So uh, vector, you are going to take one microgram. The insert, you are going to take three micrograms. Then you're going to add the enzyme, which is 0.5 to 10 units uh, per reactions. Then you're going to add the ligase buffer. So ligase buffer will actually going to have the buffer and then ATP or NADH, whichever you are actually going to use. So depending on the source of this ligase. So for example, if you are using the T4 DA ligase, it is going to have the ATP. But if you are using the E. coli ligase, it is actually going to have the NADH. Then it's also going to have the BSA. So 1x BSA and then you are going to have the sterile water. Remember that the ligase reaction has to be kept in a small volume like 20 microliter compared to that recession enzyme reactions are going to be done in a large volume such as 50 microliter because you require large quantity of water to catalyze the recession digestion reactions. 
and uh, in the in the case of ligations uh, you require the reactions to be small so that the vector and the insert which have the cohesive ends should interact with each other and that's how they are actually going to be uh, you know form the double standard dna and the nick is going to be sealed by the ligase once you have done this this uh, you are going to incubate this at 18 degrees celsius for uh, 18 to 20 hours in in circulating water bath and uh, okay now the third enzyme which is called as uh, alkaline phosphatase so alkaline phosphatase the uh, it is uh, digested linear plasmids containing why we use the alkaline phosphatase is because the digested linear plasmid containing cohesive ends on both the sides with phosphate has a tendency to recircularize okay so removing the terminal phosphate group prevents this possibility and for this purpose the alkaline phosphatase is used alkaline phosphatase removes the 5 prime terminal phosphate group and in this condition only in the presence of insert dna it will supply the phosphate group at both the ends to facilitate the ligation reaction so alkaline phosphatase is being used in those places when you are actually only using the single restriction enzyme you are not using the two restriction enzyme so in that case both the ends of the uh, the dna is actually going to have the cohesive ends which is going to have the re1 on both the sides so if you have re1 on both the sides and one side you are actually going to have the phosphate they will actually recircularize themselves uh, in the absence of even in without insert also and uh, because this guy has a phosphate and this guy has a phosphate this guy has a hydroxyl group this guy has a hydroxyl group so they will actually going to have the compatibility with each other and that's why they will recircularize so if you have the re1 versus re2 in that case uh, this particular sequence and this particular sequence will not be identical so they will not going to have the affinity for each other so if you are doing the single digestion or single enzyme digestion uh, then you are going to use the alkaline lysis alkaline phosphatase to remove the phosphate from the vector now what will happen is that in the case of vector when you are digesting it with the single restriction enzyme like for example re1 you're going to have the phosphate and hydroxyl overhangs and you're going to have hydroxyl on that side and phosphate on on this so if you put the ligase reaction they will actually recircularize without taking the insert and that's how you are actually going to get the vector uh, back instead of the clone okay so you're not going to get the clone instead the vector is actually going to recircularize and that's how it is actually going to make the background very high now if you treat this with the alkaline phosphatase you are actually going to remove this phosphate and you are going to have the hydroxyl on both the ends now if you do the ligation reaction these hydroxyl groups are not going to get ligated because you require a phosphodiester linkage so that phosphodiester linkage requires the phosphate group now if i add the uh, the insert which actually contains a phosphate group right this phosphate group will go and sit to the hydroxyl group very nicely and that's how you are going to have the two nicks on both the ends and that's how you're going to get the clone so this is actually going to give you the clone so alkaline phosphatase is always being done to reduce the background of the self ligation so this, this is called self ligation where so that you are actually going to get the vector back now apart from these enzymes some of the tools also are very popular when you are doing the molecular cloning so one of the more, uh, tool is the linker molecules a linker molecule uh, amplified foreign dna may have a restriction enzyme at their termini to give the cohesive ends to facilitate the ligation into the vector but in case where the foreign dna is genomic product and it is least possible to keep the restriction at the end cloning of these fragment is facilitated by the help of a linker molecule linker molecules are the short double stranded dna and has the restriction site at their end for example a typical linker molecule with eco r1 site is shown in this figure okay so this is what you are going to see 
linker molecule is incubated with the foreign DNA and ligated by the action of T4DNA ligase to generate the chimeric DNA. The chimeric DNA is digested with ECOR1 to generate the cohesive end and it is now incubated with ECOR1 digested vector in the presence of DNA ligase to get the circular one. So what happen is when you are producing a foreign DNA and there are restriction that you cannot be able to put the particular enzyme or some of the enzymes are already been present on your foreign DNA, right? In So in those cases, your foreign DNA is going to be the blunt end, okay? So it does not have the cohesive ends on both sides. So in those cases, what you're going to do is you're going to put the uh, a linker molecule and linker molecule is a 8 to 10 uh, nucleotide long uh, DNA, which actually going to be, uh, you know, so you can use the linker DNA. For example, in this case, this is the eco R1 linker DNA. So you, what you did is you put the linker DNA on both sides, okay, with the help of the T4 DNA ligase. And uh, that's what, when you do the digestion of this DNA, with the help of the core one, it is actually going to have the core one site on both the ends because and that's how it is actually going to be get inserted into the vector. And this is the way in which the blunt end uh, and Dean fragment can be inserted into the vector. The second molecule which also can be used is the adapter molecule. So these adapter molecules are molecules are 8 to 10 nucleotide long double standard molecule with a flanking DNA sequence to provide the cohesive ends. So in the case of linker DNA you are supposed to provide the restriction enzyme you are going to in, you know digest the linker molecules with the restriction enzymes. But what if your that particular restriction site is already present in the fragment right. So in those cases, you are not going to use the linker molecule and uh, then you can use the adapter molecule. So adapter molecules are 8 to 10 nucleotide and they are actually going to have the, uh, you know, specific uh, cohesive ends on both the ends. Okay. And so what you can do is uh, you can take the ends, uh, your gene of your interest, you put the cohesive adapter molecule. So they will actually going to fix on both the sides, right, both ends. And that's how you are actually going to use that for uh, with the vector in the reaction reaction and it will actually going to give you the chrome. So those, these cohesive ends have the free hydroxyl group to facilitate the efficient ligation into the vector. Chimeric DNA containing adapter molecule is incubated with BAMH1 digested vector in the presence of DNA ligase to give the circular DNA. So for example, these are the cohesive the adapter molecule which has the BAMH1, okay. So they both are the flanking sequence what you see is actually a BAMH1. So it will come and stick to both end of the uh, your fragment, right? This is the fragment what you have, right? And uh, then you can just put the ligation reaction into the digested vector and it is actually going to be ligated into the vector. And that's how you're going to get the clone where you are, this is the insert you have actually. So uh, this is all about the different types of enzymes and tools what we are actually going to use for molecular cloning. And uh, in our subsequent lecture, we are actually going to discuss more about the vectors which you are going to use also for the molecular cloning. So with this, I would like to conclude my lecture here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.